So Shelton New South Wales, we're the peak body in New South Wales for housing. Uh, we've been around and we're celebrating our 50 years of operation this year and we represent and advocate uh, on behalf of people who are in the lowest 40% of income bracket and not exclusively but um, increasingly it's predominant renters is who we represent. So it's all low income people whether they're living in public housing, social housing, community housing, renting um, in the private market predominantly. So I wanted, um, I'll cover a few things today and I'll tell you what I'm going to cover because we're going to take a bit of a journey through the, through the housing crisis. But I'll start with a couple of stories from Croydon where I live. One's from uh, probably about seven or eight years ago, I was chatting to one of the older residents. Um, she'd been there for a long time. I think she lives in um, quite a nice big, one of the old um, Federation houses. And we were talking about Burwood to our west, um, part of the, the Burwood um, State Electorate. And she said to me, why can't they just live in houses like we do? And she was um, talking about the, you know, the high rise in Burwood. So I'll just leave that and I'll come back to that. The, the other little story is most recently with the announcement of um, the various proposals for rezoning around uh, you know, 39 um, transport nodes around Sydney, uh, Illawarra and Newcastle. Croydon is one of them. So the Croydon community Facebook page is awash um, with rage and upset. And, but I have to say it's from land from landowners rather than, um, than renters. Renters didn't seem to get a look in. Um, and I noticed quite a number of comments about um, the impact that any affordable housing would have, this person said, on, on um, home, you know, um, home prices and an almost complete um, unawareness that Croydon has always been home to a very large number of public housing uh, tenants in various, in various parts and also a lot of people who live in boarding houses. So it just seemed that um, when I think about our suburbs, Many of us who live in our suburbs, we don't even know our communities, um, and particularly when people start to talk on behalf of those areas. I'll come back to that. So tonight I wanted to talk about three main things. The first is, um, I'll call it the social, um, the social, I'm sorry, the housing supply myth. So I feel on this day of the member for Cook making his swan song speech to the parliament, I will also make a declaration that I don't believe in miracles and I certainly don't believe in trickle-down housing and affordability. <laughs> and uh, in the next few weeks, um, there'll be an article in, in the City, uh, City Voice where I talk, they asked me to write a bit about how do we get here. So I'll cover some of the key elements of that story. And I'll talk about, you know, if I, I'm also not a gambling person, but if I was, if I was going to make a big bet, I'd bet on more social housing in New South Wales and particularly Sydney. And when I say social housing, I mean more public housing and more community housing. So I'll, I'll give you some highlights on that. I'll run through our five big policy areas at Shelton New South Wales. Um, the housing system covers a lot of things, so I'll, I'll tell you what those five things are. But in particular, I'll focus on one of those, and, and that being that one of our priorities is to make the planning system not ask it nicely, make the planning system deliver truly affordable housing for lower income people. So I'll look at that and I'll talk a little bit about uh, what we mean by um, the need for density to be done well and I'll share with you some research um, that we actually had done you know, a number of years ago about the need for equitable density. Um, so there's a few pictures for shorter products here tonight. So as, um, as we often say, the private housing market has moved a very long way from what you would think its primary purpose is, which is to house people. And we know now that you know, property is a major investment vehicle in this country and it's um, you know, a major wealth builder for investors and their families. So according to CoreLogic, the total value of residential estate in December 2023 was $10.3 trillion, $10.3 trillion. 
So we think about that kind of money and we think about this appetite for it um, being you know, really spurred on by a very generous taxation system which provides very substantial and very expensive incentives in terms of taxpayer money. And then the fire was really um, the match to this, to this um, combustible uh, scene was historically low interest rates for quite a long time which generated a lot of um, pretty cheap money to, you know, fueling the investment machine. So there's a lot at stake when it comes to the private housing sector, and that's financially and therefore politically as well. So it's a very charged environment. But we, you know, we say it's, there's a lot at stake too for the people who are um, consistently and persistently failed by it. So in the article, um, I talk about the need for more housing supply. And look, certainly a growing city, state, country needs to house its people. So we're not saying that we don't need more housing. Um, and we can see in the rental market, um, you know, rental vacancy rates are at historic lows and it's, you know, the rates of rental increases are very substantial. Um, but what we know is that for a very long time, low income renters, they do badly in that system all the time, not just in the last couple of years. So according to the ABS, 47% of low income renters in New South Wales are in housing stress. That means they're paying more and much more in many cases than 30% of their household income. And we know what that does to people. It forces people to make unreasonable choices about um, you know, critical things like food, paying bills, um, getting their car fixed, and things that actually stop them from participating in the world. And last November, uh, along with our national colleagues, we had our annual rental affordability index come out and it showed that sadly that our beautiful Sydney of Sydney is the least affordable city in the country and it's getting worse. And it showed that for some categories of people, um, you know, pensioner couples, there's so many cohorts where there is nowhere in the city that you can affordably live as a renter. And, um, you know, that's a sign of a dysfunctional place. So um, we definitely see that the private housing market has, um, is failing low-income people and, um, and when we look at a place like Sydney, Greater Sydney, um, Newcastle, Illawarra, Central Coast, there is enormous growth plan in terms of um, population and housing and what we have seen over time is a declining proportion of public and community housing and so we're very concerned if the government doesn't step up uh, dramatically the, the you know, increase in public and community housing. The percentages will you know, dwindle the land into nothing. It will become a little niche historic product um, that we'll talk about in history books. So at Shelter, um, um, you know, we look to the city of Sydney and, and um, uh, we'll hear a bit more about the city soon, but we know in the city that they have done some good work on identifying you know, the kinds of need that needs to be satisfied. There's a target to bring in an additional 14,000 affordable rental and social uh, dwellings. You know, good on the city, at least they have targets on these things. Um, and, um, you know, that 7.5% target for total stock to be social housing, we would, we'd like to see that to be at least 10. We reckon you can't be a great city um, and, and not be at least at 10% and affordable housing on top of that. So across, you know, and you've heard these kind of um, numbers before, across um, New South Wales at the end of December, there's nearly 58,000 households um, approved waiting, on the social waiting for social housing. And that includes about over 8,000 priority cases. So these are really um, dire situations. And in the inner city, um, you know, we're talking about 5,000. So we do acknowledge that we need more homes. And, um, but we, we really don't believe that just this idea that somehow the private sector will develop housing where it's, you know, where it's needed, when we need it, at a, at a, um, a price that is affordable for people. We just, we just don't believe that that will happen. Um, but what we do believe and what we do know, and this is the good news, is that social and affordable housing is a great investment for the future of the state. It is a sure bet. And even better, we know the government has um, the power 
the money and it's doing a land audit, it's got the land and it has a moral imperative to make it happen. So that's kind of the big picture. So at Shelter, we, you know, we talk about the, the A's. We need um, affordable homes that cater to a diverse range of people. We need accessible housing for people of all different abilities um, throughout their whole life and their, whole, their family's whole life. And we need development that is well designed and well maintained. So that's kind of what we're after. Now, when I think about um, how do we summarise what are the big things we're pushing for? It's really five key areas. So the first is we want to see social housing, social public housing and community housing restored to being the, the safety net that, that it once was. And right now, if you thought of a safety net, there's massive holes. You, it, it doesn't constitute anything that looks like a safety net. So um, at the bare minimum, we think every local government area needs at least 5% of all its housing to be um, social housing. Across New South Wales, we're well down 4% now. So we're talking about a very small amount of stock. And if, if the state is going to grow, then the government needs to not only just catch up, it needs to get ahead of this. So um, along with our colleagues and other peaks, we talk about the need to, uh, you know, let's get back to 5%, at least 5% everywhere, and then 10% um, pretty quickly by 2040. And the kinds of production we'd need is about 5,000 extra, so additional social housing buildings every year to make that happen. Um, now, given that New South Wales typically um, builds about 47,000 uh, new homes a year, you can see it would be a big chunk, but that's the kinds of rates that we need. So that's number one. That's our big, our big ask. We need more social housing, and we say you don't even have to build it. Go and buy it. You know, um, the Queensland government has recently bought aged care, um, you know, uh, old aged age care homes that are empty. They're converting it. They've bought hotels that they're converting straight into um, housing for transitional crisis housing. In some cases, the smartest um, and the best use of public money would be to simply buy um, some, some homes and in, in some locations. They might even be half-built buildings if they're good enough quality. Um, that could be a good investment. And that includes maintenance. You know, we're asking for uh, $500 million extra into maintenance because we know there's some homes that are not fit uh, for anyone to live in and for upgrades. And there's a number of empty um, public housing dwellings around the place that could be fixed up, you know, relatively quickly and returned to service. Uh, our number two ask is that the specialist homelessness sector is um, just in, you know, has always struggled, um, but you know, it's in, in chronic need of extra funding. Now, 50% of people who come to their doors asking for help are turned away. So, can you imagine being turned away? Can you imagine being a worker in those centres? who literally has to say to someone, we can't help you, we don't have enough beds. So that system needs um, a 20%, at least 20% increase in funding. And that's to deal with the crisis. I'll come back to number three, because that's the planning one. Um, number four is to build more accessible and climate ready dwellings. And that's everyone. So if we're building new stock of any housing anywhere, um, it needs to be fit for um, um, the changing climate and it needs to be fit for low income people who live in those dwellings so that they're not paying ridiculous amounts of money in heating and cooling costs. And we're pleased to see the New South Wales and Commonwealth commit um, over 200 million, just uh, they announced it before Christmas, 200 million dollars over four years to upgrade um, social housing properties. Um, for their energy efficiency, and we know that will make a big contribution um, to people's um, um, you know, energy bills. We've got one big priority around supporting renters and renting. Um, you know, renting is not a phase people are just going through. Um, many people, third of, third of households rent, and many will rent for their whole lives, and it ought to be a legitimate and decent way to, to um, enjoy your life. So we have a number of initiatives where, and campaigns we're supporting. Probably the biggest is to remove no grounds evictions in this state. 
if if um, if it happens in its entirety, that our friends of the tenants union talk about, it will be the biggest reform. But they, you know they've been fighting for it for you know 20, 30 years. So um, it's currently in the balance because um, we need no grounds evictions removed from fixed and periodic uh, ten, uh, leases. And currently, there's um, we're sensing there's some the government's getting a bit wobbly about applying it to fixed term leases as well. So we need it because we know the lack of it now is um, actually encouraging the churning of tenants. So landlords churning tenants to test the market because they've heard, if I evict you, I might be able to get 200, 300 extra um, for rent. So we, we know that if we fix that, it would take a lot of the heat out of the rental market in terms of that hardship. Our other big initiative is we um, and we've backed this for a long time before it became fashionable, um, we want to see a change to how short-term rental, so Airbnb and other things uh, are managed in the state, so there's currently a discussion paper out. We've been uh, working on it for some time and uh, went into bat with Byron Bay Council um, gee, probably a year ago now in support of their efforts. Um, to get a better um, management of short-term rental accommodation in their um, particular LGA. So the last one I wanted to talk about was um, the planning system. So our big, and it's number three on our list of five, was that you know, we need to make the planning system deliver truly affordable rental housing for lower income people. And um, we know there's a lot of initiatives around at the moment, um, the government is has a very big density push, and we're not against it. We, I tell you what we're for. We are for um, communities that are well supported. We are against urban sprawl that puts people into the fringes of the city. Um, in Koala and food production territory, um, up around all the coastal areas. I've got, I grew up in Newcastle on Corrifi when I see these vast suburbs just sprawling. There is no public transport. There are no schools. Um, and you know, you wonder about the life, particularly if you're at home all the time. What does it feel like to live in some of these suburbs, um, particularly when you're poor? So we're not against density, but what we are for is um, to make sure that um, housing is well built, that we do have density done well. And when we talk about that, we want to see a substantial amount of social and affordable housing being part of this density. So we're hearing the government talk a bit about some requirements for affordable housing. We've heard nothing about what they're going to contribute on their own land uh, in terms of more public housing on their own land. Uh, we want to see collaborative master plans. So we know um, in many cases that it's one thing to have a great building, but if the great building is not supported by a great suburb that's walkable, that's easy for people to move around, that's got great services, then um, you know, it's, it's not really a good, a good plan. And we definitely want to see planning um, you know, and requirements within that, that density push to protect tree canopy. Um, and I know it's not very sexy, but once, once you hear about deep soil, it's hard not to know it. You, know, you can't have tree canopy without deep soil. So um, everyone loves trees. But it's the deep soil that we need to sustain, you know, the, the types of canopy we see around the inner city in some suburbs. Um, there might be an idea that they'll grow trees, but there's actually no soil that will sustain something substantial. So um, I'm going to wrap up in a minute. In fact, maybe now. But um, what I will commend to you is a series that we sponsored um, a few years ago. Uh, City Futures from New South Wales Uni um, produced it for us. It's the Equitable Density Series. And to give you an idea of the framework, one is about the building, one is about the neighbourhood, and then the last one is about um, the metropolitan area. And it's kind of saying it ought to be the case that um, denser environments can be a decent place for, for low-income people to live, but if it's not planned for, it won't happen. And it's trying to um, remind decision makers that you have to plan for a really great um, living environment, particularly if you're low-income. 
So it's, um, I've put a few copies if people want to take it. The things like, in a much denser environment, you know, neighbours, noise, kids, um, community areas. Not everyone does want to share the space in the community area, so how do you manage that? Um, the role of councils in supporting services that bring people together in denser environments. Uh, the need for, you know, really great walkable suburbs um, and well-built, you know, buildings, um, particularly for low-income homeowners, so they don't get stung by, you know, massive strata fees and, and really difficult um, bureaucratic um, processes that they get into. So I won't talk too much longer except to say definitely all for more housing, but we, don't, we can't trust the private housing market to deliver it. It's utterly unreliable. We don't hate private developers. Um, it's not personal, it's business. And, um, but we do um, have faith in government if it puts its mind to it to do something decent with its own land and money. Thank you. So lovely to be back here. I haven't spoken at Politics in the Pub for a while and um, I miss you all as many friends in the audience. And I'm always very keen to talk about housing, as people would know but it seems like even beyond what we would expect in terms of um, the scale of the crisis and bad policy decisions being made by the government in theoretically the fix it that make are going to make things worse, it's come on to us even faster than we thought it was going to this year. So it's, it's very timely to keep having this conversation because it's really important and the kind of decisions that are being made about how we build our city lock us in on particular paths that are very hard to change. That's part of how we've gotten the housing crisis we've got at the moment. Um, the, the theme of the talk is pro-people solutions. I'm going to focus on the solutions stuff and hopefully bring a little bit of inspiration um, around what is possible. Not all things that we are currently doing in this city and in this country, but certainly things that we could be doing and would mean that we could both be creating extra density and creating more homes for people to live in but actually making them better quality and places that people can afford. It is possible, um, and so I'm hoping to share a bit of inspiration with you. I don't have any handouts. I do have a report I'll refer to at, um, that we wrote last year after a visit, but um, you'll have to come up to me at the end and I'll have to email you a copy or email you a copy. I didn't quite get organised enough. So um, I should acknowledge also, obviously, as a, at the start of the talk, that um, we're meeting on Gadigal Country, and particularly here in Glebe, um, which is where I grew up and I've never moved very far away, that um, there's an incredible history of resistance and of um, Gadigal families and other civil rights activists located and, and from this place. And we're very lucky to be continuing this political discussion. Um, so it's so important to you know, acknowledge that history that continues to inspire, but also because this conversation about who gets to live in the city um, when we talk about public housing, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities continue to be at the front line because that, those are the communities that disproportionately live in the kind of housing that is at so much at the whim of government policy. So I'm going to talk about what councils are doing, um, things we're doing well and things we could be doing better, um, what the New South Wales government is doing, and also some inspiration about what other international cities are doing, particularly London and Paris, that we could be doing here and that they are doing better than us and are the reason that we, 10 years ago, Sydney was, um, it was more expensive to live in London and Paris 10 years ago and now Sydney has leapfrogged those two cities, um, partly because they have ta tried to tackle at both the council and the state and the national level the housing crisis um, in many more ways than we have tried here. I feel like when we talk about high housing and solutions, it's like the climate crisis. There's not one silver bullet. There's a, we're doing about 30 or 50 things wrong that we need to change or need to do more of, and that is the same. So I'm going to have try and focus in on a couple of solutions, but also throw a number of other ideas out there, and then we can sort of include them in the discussion if people want to know more. So in terms of what's happening now, so the, the way the housing system works in New South Wales at least, is the state gives the city council's targets. It says, we want you to build this many homes, we want you to build this many jobs. Go ahead and do it. And for the city of Sydney, um, that target was to grow the size of the city, the number of people living in the city, by at least 30% over 15 years. That's huge, and we're on track to do it. Um, not all councils have met their targets, but they have been waiting for updated targets, and no one has affordable housing targets. It's one thing everyone's been asking for. If we're growing our city, and you give us these targets, and we look at our map of where we can go and say, look, this makes sense, 
Green Square now the densest uh, suburb in Australia, Piermont the second densest in Australia, in the city of Sydney in the inner city, um, but you had to do a whole bunch of infrastructure to make that work. You've got all these people living there, you've got to have the train that works so you can move them to the jobs. There's hundreds of millions of dollars spent on a trunk drain so that all the housing doesn't find in Green Square. That's the sort of good planning if you say you want your city to be bigger and denser, you want to know where it's going to go because then you can do all that stuff not just for the quality of life for people to live there, but to mean they can get anywhere else and do the jobs you expect them to do, which is why you've, you know, as well as obviously have schools and green space and, you know, housing that they that isn't so tiny that they um, don't want to live in it because the system's so deregulated that there's no quality and you don't get a window and you don't get a view. So in terms of what is happening, at least in the inner city, big, strong targets that are already there that we're on track to meet them. Um, but... And within that, um, I think it was, it was mentioned by Cathy, we have a one of, are the only council in the state that has, charges developers for every development they do to go towards affordable housing. It's a tiny amount, it's one to three percent. And when we rezone a building so that suddenly something that was four storeys is now 10 storeys and it's worth a whole lot more money, we can take a little bit more off the top. But it's not making a dent. Effectively, we set a target here at the City of Sydney, which is too low. I think the 10% target set by Shelter is higher than the one we've got, but it is still too low. And we are going backwards in terms of the amount of public housing. More of it's being demolished than is being replaced. Um, and we are growing it so slowly that we're not even growing at a 1% rate. And we're not going to meet the targets that we've set. So there's a time for a complete rethink, and there's other things that we're doing to try and sort of protect boarding houses and stop the sort of low income housing that's being lost there. We're putting some new rules, which the property industry is already organized to try and block, but we hope we can get in to say, um, to stop with net dwelling loss. For example, if someone wants to buy three terraces and gut them and make one mansion, or buy an apartment block and make it a series of much fewer but very expensive apartments, we're trying to find get the powers to refuse that, to say, look, we want our city to grow. We can't be taking away the rare, affordable-ish housing we've got so that people can have fancier places to live. If you want a mansion, go buy somewhere there's already a mansion. Don't gut, don't um, cannibalise that stock that we've got. So we've got to protect what we've we're working to protect what we've got, but also the big ticket item is as we grow, how much of that can we actually make affordable? And this is where it leads into um, what the state government is doing, some of which unfortunately is going to make housing even less affordable. So there are some things, you know, we were, a lot of us were quite hopeful about the incoming Labor government, about promises made that public housing would be expanded and not privatised, that it wouldn't be demolished, um, that there are major redevelopments of public land that were going to actually include higher targets for affordable housing. And any of those announcements have either not happened or been very modest. There are some good changes, creating a big new housing department through Homes New South Wales. There's real hope in that. The idea that you have the department that looks after the people that live in the public homes being the same department that builds them, rather than split apart. You don't treat housing so much like an asset. There's some real hope that that can work. But the big ticket items is what is demanded of developers, because private development is still the biggest thing that decides what our city looks like. And in, um, the reason, in my view, we strongly have um, a bad housing system that's getting worse is we effectively have said developers can do whatever they want. They can decide the kind of housing they're going to um, build and where they build it and when they build it and we rezone so suddenly something that was this tall is this tall and it's worth a lot, lot more money because you can build more apartments in it. We're not going to take any of that and give it back to the public. So the public has stepped back, less public housing, less public role, and we've said developers do what you want, and that is how we've ended up in this situation. The planning reforms that have been announced by the state government before Christmas, and have just um, have had a very short period to close submissions, but the state government hasn't agreed to an extension. Some of them sound good on paper, and some of them are good. The idea that you build density on top of train stations makes complete sense. We have done that in the city. That's why Green Square is so dense. It's why there's going to be more housing in Piemont. Um, Waterloo's going to have a lot of housing. That's already underway. So those particular reforms don't apply in the inner city because the stations they've picked are not ones we were already doing it. The big one is um, this thing called diverse and well-located homes. Oh, that sounds pretty good. <coughs> And it is effectively saying, if a developer wants to build something that's four to six storeys, 
it cannot be refused because of height or um, density. So what that means is, and, and 90, this covers 90% of the city area, so it will cover the entirety of Glebe. So anywhere in Glebe could be a six-storey building and the, it would be almost impossible for the council to refuse it. The reason that will not help affordable housing <coughs> is it's not, it's not following the same kind of rules that are planned. It will actually switch off those powers that council had that I talked about before, where if a building goes from here to here, we say, okay, your land's worth a lot more money, it's rezoned, we can take a bit of that and we'll give it to a community housing provider and they'll build some housing. Some of it has to be affordable. Um, it will switch those off. So there's no protection that any of that is going to be affordable. What it will do is mean if you're already a property <coughs> investor or a developer or you own your house, your house will be worth a hell of a lot more money because suddenly it could be a six-storey apartment block. So it will jump immediately, and Shelter has some references to this, I think, in their submission, the cost of land, basically widening even further that gap between who has land and who has a home and who's a first homeowner and who already has a home that home is going to be worth more and investors will be able, their land will be worth more. The hope somehow with no regulation is that then there'll be apartments and then the apartments will be cheaper because there'll be more apartments. You know, um, if those apartments are sold as opposed to just being rented really expensively with no controls over rents. And so that's that's why it's, 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 they're more radical, these changes, in terms of handing more powers over to the market and pulling back the role of the public in the regulation than was ever tried under the Liberal government. Like, more brazen, and they will mean, if implemented, just a, an acceleration of the haves and have-nots that we have and an and even stronger role for develop, the development industry to con and investors to control the housing system, essentially. Now. The, the good news is that it doesn't need to be that way. Um, the report I was referring to that I failed to bring any copies of was I had the chance so this and I said um, I had the chance to visit Paris and London councils and meet with the deputy mayors of housing last year to ask how it was they were um, doing so much better in terms of affordability, and they are doing some things very differently than us, and some things we're doing a tiny bit of. They're doing much more of. One of the key things they're doing is they are make, they are demanding more of developers. So in London, when you rezone, it's a 35% minimum that comes back to um, for affordable housing. And we had a guest speaker from London um, yesterday at the Sydney Town Hall who was talking us through how this actually works in practice. And it is similar in um, Paris, which is obviously a socialist government. We have a, a Labour government with a green minority at the council level in, in London. Um, and they set radically stronger targets. They say we want one, so I think um, they want in Paris 40% of all the housing in their city to be affordable um, in less than 10 years. That's because they already met their target of going from 10% to 25%. They met it and they met it early because they're doing the two things of demanding more of development and saying to the private industry, if you want to build, there's a lot of money to be made, we need to take this much back to actually have public and affordable and community housing. Um, and they're also building a lot more public housing. So they're doing those two things at once, which we're really not doing. We have less public housing to start with. Um, so the role of the public, either as building things directly and being a landlord or regulating and demanding um, private industry delivers for affordability is so much stronger. So according to, um, According to the Mayor of London, 44% of the new housing they built in London, so nearly half last year, was affordable or public or social. Like, which is just radically different than here. Now they have a lot more public housing to start with, but they're also in a public housing boom, which is local council led, where the local councils are infilling their public housing estates, they're focusing on um, renovation, not demolition, which is faster and more sustainable. But they also give their tenants more rights in that. They, they give their tenants the right to vote on whether they want the plan or not because they don't want to break up communities. They've learnt the lessons we have not learnt here of the suicides and the, and the deaths that come from when you break up a traumatised and small community that is very vulnerable. Um, but in, the, in those places, in, in London, and we had some great inspiration um, about what was working, they sit down with the tenants and say, Your, this public housing is in very poor condition. We want to upgrade it 
we're going to give you a right of return. So we're going to work with you because this is going to be your home afterwards. So work with us to develop the design. We will open the books to you and you will see how much maybe needs to be sold or privatised. They aim for no more than 20 or 30%. Um, but talk to us also what you want our homes to look like. Sometimes people want to live in medium rise, sometimes they want to live in smaller houses, sometimes they've had a nice experience in higher rise housing because they have nice views. So they work with the tenants to develop something and then the tenants vote on whether the plan will go ahead or not. So they have real rights backing up this principle of learning. This is only the last five years. They've had something like 20, 21 ballots, 20 of them have passed, one of them did not, the different estates. Um, and they, they, by keeping the, the public in control of the whole process as well, rather than just doing what we do here, where we give a bit of public land to a developer and say, go develop it, and oh, can you give us back maybe 30% of the public? Might be affordable, might be public. Um, they say, we can keep control of the whole thing. We'll engage you to build it, but we're in charge. We'll engage the architect, and if anything needs to be sold at the end, we'll decide how much. So in, um, that means we keep every bit of the profit, it's not carved off, and in some of those projects, they thought they'd have to sell off, say, 20% of the site to pay for the rest of it, but they've ended up having to sell less than they needed to or buy back some of the apartments that they were going to make private because their motivation as a public agency, as councils, is to have nice homes for their constituents to live in, not to make a profit. And so they don't, they can, all the money that comes in can be reinvested into good quality. So they're doing this big public housing thing that we're not doing here, but we could do. We certainly have a lot of public land where this approach could be taken and existing estates where we could focus on partnering with tenants, um, doing it in a way that actually supports the community not being broken up, sort of saying we'll redevelop that bit and then you move in there and then we'll do your building and then you move back. That's how it works. It doesn't slow down the development, it just means that it's less traumatic. Um, and we demand more of private developers. And don't just give us cash to private developers when you do the land. We require you to build everywhere. So Paris has an amazing strategy where they're trying to put more public housing in all the wealthy areas because they're like, there's already too much public housing in the low income areas. They're building it and they're buying it. So they're doing it quite expensively. We had, um, and there's, there's very few excuses. You're not allowed to get out of it. So we had this moment where we visited the super expensive um, shopping center, which is like David Jones to the max, right in the center. It's called La Samaritaine in um, Paris. And the top two floors of public housing because they were renovating the building and they had to do their percentage of public or and they're like, well, you build it then. And you couldn't put it anywhere else, so they had to have the top floors because that was the most appropriate place to have the housing. So you go past the Cartier and the Pearl exhibition and they were like, where's the public housing entrance? Oh, it's around the side, I see. So it's just a completely different approach to what is possible. It has not stopped development in those cities. Those cities are still building and creating lots of new homes, particularly London. But it's changed the kind of housing that is being built. Um, and just, just the, the, what is the main difference is the sense of inspiration and the targets and the willingness to say this only works if the public has the leading role. We regulate, we have strong rules, the developers will build anyway, still lots of money to be made, and we're gonna get the most out of, and we're gonna control all of the bits of the public land redevelopment too, because we wanna make sure we capture and keep all the profit for, for the pub to go back into the public and not let it be creamed off by private development. That's the main difference about what they're doing well and we're not doing, and it is the exact opposite direction that, that this state government wants to take our planning system. You wouldn't know that from the simplified debate, that any time you say no, you must only care about heritage, not care about buildings. I think that's what the NIMBY NIMBY debate is at its simplified level. They've got a lot, lot stronger heritage protections in Paris and London than they have here. I've got to tell you, I've got a lot of older buildings. But it, is also, it, it has not stopped development. They, ha they are also cities that are growing. So anyway, it's just, I've always feel the need to, we have such myths around this in, um, in our debate that it seems always locked in this question of density or not and supply or not when the conversation itself is much more sophisticated and that we need to learn lessons that are, some of them are old lessons about what's working and what's not from our own city and from other places around the world. So I think um, I did have a lot of other things I was going to say but I didn't read any of my notes and just talked about some things I wanted to talk about. So if there's any questions, and some other, I wonder if anyone's going to ask me what the Greens are doing in the Senate. I'm um, very happy to answer those as well. But that was the main message, I guess, in terms of 
trying to understand um, how we can pick a different path, um, how a Labor government can pick a different path, and um, the sorts of things we should be fighting for so we're not caught in that trap of no, don't do it that way, actually do it this way instead. This is the way we want to build our cities and we can have everything we want. The one loser in that will be developer profits and I'm okay with that. That's okay. So, anyway, thanks Peter.